The Civil War is one of those watershed moments in United States history that every American is likely to either learn about or at least hear about many times throughout their lives. The Confederacy's attempt to break away from the Union in order to preserve the institution of slavery is as ingrained in the American conscience as the Revolutionary War, creating national icons and controversy through this very day. One aspect of Civil War America that is barely discussed, if at all, is the period after the Civil War, a period known as Reconstruction. The history of Reconstruction has gone through various phases in its perception by historians and the wider public, as the US itself went through various phases over the last century and a half. One thing that never changed, however, was the understanding that the Reconstruction period that lasted until 1877 was ultimately a failure in its goals. I'll discuss more about those goals and how it failed later, but before that, I'm going to give a brief synopsis of America just after the Civil War leading into Reconstruction. There was an attempt by President Andrew Johnson, who had taken over the White House only a month prior after Abraham Lincoln was famously shot and killed, to quickly readmit the Southern rebel states to the Union. Johnson, a Southern Democrat himself and hardly sympathetic to the radical Republicans that dominated Congress, wanted as light of a Reconstruction as possible. This led to a situation where, very quickly after the war, many former Confederates were attempting to move themselves back into the fold of Union politics. Simultaneously, many of the former Confederate states were enacting so-called Black Codes, which had the goal of ensuring subservience of the newly freed enslaved peoples, something that even contemporaries of the time could tell was an attempt to reintroduce slavery without calling it slavery. After the election of 1866, however, the Republican Party found themselves with a supermajority in Congress, and thus able to override the veto of Andrew Johnson. Following this, four bills known as the Reconstruction Acts were passed from 1867 to 1868. Though Reconstruction technically began right at the end of the Civil War, and some argue even before the end of the Civil War, this is where Reconstruction as we know it today really began in earnest. The implementation of the Reconstruction Acts was fairly simple. The United States military was stationed in various locations in southern states as the federal government sought to not only integrate these states back into the Union, but also to ensure that the Reconstruction Amendments being passed, that is the 13th Amendment abolishing chattel slavery, the 14th Amendment granting citizenship and equal rights to all, and the 15th Amendment codifying universal manhood suffrage regardless of race, were being not only recognized by the state governments, but also treated as the law of the land throughout the state's territory. Additionally, after the Reconstruction Acts were passed, many former Confederates were barred from running for office or even voting, and Republican governments were soon established throughout the former Confederacy. During this time, not only were African Americans voting in droves, but active black participation in politics also soared. From 1869 to 1877, just under 20% of all Southern political offices were held by black Americans. This included two U.S. Senators, Hiram Rhodes Revels and Blanche Bruce, both from Mississippi. Just for reference, the next African American to represent a Southern state in the U.S. Senate would be Tim Scott, who was appointed to fill a vacancy in 2013, nearly a century and a half later. Unfortunately, that is the lasting legacy of Reconstruction, a brief glimpse into a brighter future of racial equality in America that was ultimately snuffed out. Now, while Reconstruction technically ended with the Compromise of 1877, which saw Rutherford B. Hayes taking the U.S. presidency in return for ending Reconstruction, the truth about Reconstruction's end is much more complicated. For many decades, a myth permeated much of American society that Reconstruction failed because of corrupt scalawags and carpetbaggers. That is, white Southerners who supported Reconstruction and white Northerners who traveled south to support Reconstruction. As well as this notion that African Americans that voted and ran for office were unfit for those duties leading to inept governments. This is far from the historical consensus now as those ideas are the result of decades of white supremacist propaganda. The real reasons for Reconstruction's failure, while complicated, can be largely simplified down to a few main things. First of all, 
most white Southerners were incredibly resentful of the military occupation and any attempt to enforce racial equality and integration after generations of the exact opposite being the status quo. Despite there being increasing class tension between poor planters and plantation owners, especially at the end of and directly after the Civil War, the mutual disdain for anything resembling racial equality transcended those class divides. Second, the efforts of Andrew Johnson specifically and Southern sympathizers generally to hamstring Reconstruction efforts wherever possible. Though, with Johnson specifically, as I mentioned, the Republicans had a supermajority, so it may not have had a majorly negative effect on a lot of legislation. On the other hand, however, having a president who would have been sympathetic or even outright supportive of Reconstruction efforts from the beginning may have been a great asset. Finally, and this is the most significant factor, but the reign of terror perpetuated by white supremacists in the South. Though the U.S. military was stationed throughout the southern states, they hardly had the numbers to mount a proper counterinsurgency campaign against the white supremacists that roamed throughout their respective states, using terror tactics to intimidate both black citizens, but also their white supporters, into passivity. Modern estimates suggest that there would have needed to be up to 180,000 federal troops in the south, with low estimates being around 20,000 consistently for the duration of Reconstruction. In reality, though, the number never even reached 20,000 in the beginning of Reconstruction, and would only decline over the next decade until all troops were pulled out in 1877. The U.S. military did not have the numbers to stop these terroristic acts, and although exact numbers are hard to pinpoint, many thousands if not tens of thousands of African Americans were murdered throughout the South with some estimating these numbers well surpassed the total number of lynchings that occurred after the end of Reconstruction, and all of this only within the period of about one decade. Ultimately, the failure of the US government to protect its citizens led to a feeling that this was all for naught, so public support for the occupation of the South dropped year by year. Now, when we talk about the success of Reconstruction, what does that really mean? At the time, for some, it simply meant abolishing slavery, readmitting the southern states, healing the Union, and then moving on. However, what I consider to be something resembling a success was the rough agenda of the radical Republicans. That is, fair and free elections with a democratic rule of law, preventing wide-scale violence against black communities and their white supporters, as well as racial equality before the law, unconditional black male suffrage, economic independence, and equal representation in government. Now, how could Reconstruction have succeeded? To put it simply, the US government would have needed to be much stronger willed in its fight against white supremacist violence. The Enforcement Acts of 1870 and 1871 under Ulysses S. Grant's administration, though limited in their scope, did show that decisive and strong actions against these violent groups could be successful, as the backs of the KKK were broken in many areas the acts were implemented. Additionally, it's almost a given that black militias would need to be allowed to form and also actively supported by the federal government in order for African American communities to be able to protect themselves rather than rely on federal troops. In the areas where black militias did form, these areas generally saw great success in protecting themselves and their rights. Finally, and most simply, a large military presence and a longer occupation of the region would be necessary to fight the insurgency of white supremacy. With a more aggressive mandate, and the troops to back up those mandates, the federal government would have been far more capable of protecting the people they were supposed to protect. And a longer occupation would allow for more time to let these changes become permanent in the mind of white southerners resisting these changes. Had these changes occurred, we very possibly could have seen a successful reconstruction, and the United States could have jump-started its progress towards true racial equality. Even a totally successful reconstruction would not and could not have addressed all the ills created by slavery, but it would have prevented the need for as strong of a civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s, which is sometimes referred to as the Second Reconstruction. <laughs> 
However, I'm very skeptical of whether Reconstruction could have ever succeeded realistically. Ignoring the fact that we have the benefit of hindsight now, there were many reasons that none of these things were ever implemented in the Reconstruction of the South. As far as mobilizing black militias, it was often seen as a threat, not only to former Confederates and white Southern supremacists, but even to their alleged Republican supporters. Not only were white Reconstructionists wary of mobilizing black communities in and of itself, it was also viewed as a non-starter for reconciliation with white Southerners that opposed Reconstruction. The key mistake here was with Republican governments attempting to reconcile with the people who sought their very destruction. By choosing to try and keep the peace more often than not, they weakened their own situation and threatened the lives of vulnerable citizens across the South. And as far as the US sending more troops to the South and lengthening their occupation, this was unlikely for a variety of reasons. First, there was simply a general distrust among all Americans about an overly ascendant federal government with that level of military power and oversight, especially compared to today's standards. Even radical Republicans hardly considered expanding the military in order to achieve their goals of a successful Reconstruction. Additionally, as U.S. settlers continued to move west, troops were becoming increasingly necessary for the federal government to force native tribes off their lands. Finally, and most simply, the United States experienced a massive economic downturn with the crash of 1873. A downturn so large, it was known as the Great Depression for several decades until, well, you know. This downturn not only had large effects on the U.S. economy, but also saw the Republicans lose their majority in both congressional houses in 1874. At a structural level, the federal government was unable to create state governments that were seen as legitimate by a majority of the white Southerners. This seems obvious in retrospect as the only legitimate government for many of them would be a government that sought to create a strict racial caste system, which was directly at odds with the point of Reconstruction. Finally, even some of the most progressive people by the time standards were still racist to varying degrees. There was a general distrust in African Americans to be capable politicians and voters. And so many of these progressives were often very paternalistic and condescending in their outlook of how to have a successful Reconstruction. The story of Reconstruction can be summed up as the story of a failed occupation to try and bring something resembling freedom to a land. It's not entirely dissimilar to the American occupations of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Vietnam. Although there are obvious differences, such as those nations having very different cultures from the US's, whereas the southern and northern US in the mid to late 1800s was still comparatively fairly similar, and the clearest difference being that the US had far less legitimate reasons to be in those other countries. On the other hand, there are some similarities in how the situations played out, with the most striking one being the inability for the United States to learn its lesson on how to capably lead a counterinsurgency before the situation spirals out of control. To this day, the specter of Reconstruction's failure can still be seen. Even though American society is far more racially equitable than it was in 1865, there still remain many unsolved problems of racial inequality, from the economic to the judicial, that stem from Reconstruction's failure. Thank you very much for watching. Leave a like if you enjoyed my video, and subscribe to my channel with notifications turned on to see more of my content. Leave a comment with your thoughts on this video or topics for the future, and if you're interested, I've also made plenty of other videos, so go check those out too. This has been Historical Hindsight, and I'll be seeing you soon.